Thank you very much, Palakivala Foundation, for inviting me. Once I look forward to sharing my thoughts with the, this August audience in Chennai. Because of the way in which the center has grown and uh, the association, very strong association with uh, Palakipala himself, it's not an easy task. And uh, when I did ask Anand if he would want a written paper to be presented, he made my job even more difficult by saying no. So, with a sense of hesitation, despite the things one can always speak, being where I am placed now, and despite the uh, limitation, because in another 10 days the budget itself will have to be presented, I seem to be in not so enviable position. So, with a little uh, expectation and of certain level of indulgence from the audience, I'll try to balance my act, not so much to say so much of what is happening in the preparation of the budget, at the same time not to also be too cagey about what we want to do. So if you'd permit me, I'd broadly get to talking about the topic, about which I suppose each one of us can have an idea of how to reach the $5 trillion economy. And every idea is a worthy idea, but yet, most ideas, like the way I think one of the speakers said, he'd written to the then Chief Minister and then the Prime Minister as to what happened to that idea of forming an alliance for ourselves and so on. Every idea gets subsumed into some idea within the four walls of the government and then it flows out. So I'm sure each one of us have some thought about how we can reach the five trillion, but yet there are to say the least, difficulties and also the challenges and the channels which the government sets for itself to flow out with its activities. But largely, I think I'll recall one of the lines which the Honorable Prime Minister has said and which I think holds good for not just India for, but for any democracy is he used three words in Hindi which clearly states where he believes the government should be and why is it important that he believes and therefore it's important. It's important because he's the first among equals and the elected prime minister who campaigned on a manifesto, who stated things in his manifesto and therefore if I pick on one very critical line of the prime minister which he probably sets out quite often and I think that will capture as to the spirit with which the government would want to work towards a five trillion dollar economy. And you, I'm sure you've heard it before. Sarkar ka abhav nahi hona chahiye, prabhav hona chahiye, aur dabhav nahi hona chahiye. Matlab, abhav and dabhav both of which are not desirable. Abhav is inadequacy or lack of adequate presence or shortfall. You don't need a shortfall. Where a government should be present, it should be present. Where it is expected to function, it should function. So there should not be a above. Dabhav is the other which you don't want from the government. What is dabhav? Pressure. The government's impact, too much of an impact from the government. The stress caused by the government. So you don't want the stress of the government. You don't want a complete absence of the government. What should be there? That's the prabhav. Prabhav is broadly an influence, broadly facilitation, broadly the, the philosophy with which it is mandated to govern. It's got the mandate through the election. The mandate is spelt out in so many different ways in its manifesto. So, to that extent, government should be there. So, if what is this route towards $5 trillion? 
The root is this. We'll have to be there to facilitate. We'll have to be there to make it easy. We have to be there where you find that there is no policy at all, there is no direction. You lay the policy before and you don't do it by sitting in one room. You consult people, take source of information, every letter, every mail or every cloud sourced information or every such interaction, it's taken in. But above is in many counts you want the government to be faster. You are not adequately in the race with us. You have to be with us, get ahead of certain curve and give us a policy. So that is, you know, government's presence should be there. You're not really catching up with the scene, you have to catch up. So if I were to broadly characterize, therefore, this route through which you're going to achieve $5 trillion, it is this. No excessive dabav, no excessive abhav, but certainly prabhav. So if that is broadly laid out, how do you think we have done in the last few years, in the last term? And what are the things which we want to do now? One thing is very clear when it comes to, although in many of the things before I say that sentence, many of the things, even as you implement it, it's not actually up to the expectation of your own measure. For instance, Prime Minister Modi often says, look, I don't believe in incremental changes. We want good transformational change in everything that we do because at the stage at which India is today, you can't afford to have little marginal increments. You have to move rapidly. Your youth, whose number is to our advantage, want rapid change. They want an India which can catch up with everyone's aspiration. And therefore he says, look, let's plan in such a way that you're not going to have little incremental changes in every sector. It should be so transformative that our young feel that there is hope. But in that, you might still say the last five uh, years you could have done a lot more things, but you never did. You still were incremental. That can be a critical uh, analysis of the government, and I'm fully willing to buy that. I'm fully willing to buy that because... Post-2014, the kind of cleaning up that a government had to do was unbelievable. And we undertook that exercise without a grudge, without a worry, without saying, oh my God, is this the extent to which we have to do the cleaning? We had to do it. It's part of the game. And therefore, I remember very clearly between 14, 15 and 16, there were immense lot of questions saying, why is the Land Reforms Act not passed? You're incapable of doing it. Your majority is not sufficient. Your Rajya Sabha position. But it is a matter of fact that that law, if it required further amendments or it had to be recast, it was a reality that you had to take states on board. Land, after all, is ultimately with the states. And you are planning to do something because something which was passed in 2013 really did not meet the expectations of many of the states. It made the whole business of acquiring land beyond any government's state or center's capability because it had tied itself in knots. So you wanted to do something in that. You didn't do in the first few years. And then even after that you sat over it. Is the allegation or is the criticism against us? I'm fully willing to buy that. And why is that? with the states having their own thoughts about how this land acquisition will impact this act, will impact any land acquisition effort of any state. You really couldn't have done rapidly something. But yet, that very same government, our government, Modi's government, could effectively handle the GST. Even where you required all the states to be on board, you had to convince the states about how one tax for one nation would really make a difference. So if you thought you were not able to make a difference in the Land Acquisition Act, you could make it in the GST. So if Modi believed in the transformational change and not the marginal incremental change, it worked out in GST where you sat with the states and I take with due respects the name of my predecessor who really sat with all the states, Sri Arun Jaitley, and who was able to bring that change over and pass with the GST law. All right, it might have issues. I'll come to that in a minute. 
So that incremental change and not just incremental but transformational change, I have given you these two examples to say if this government wants and if it realizes that it is something with which popular opinion and also states are together, you are able to make a difference. So that is one of the routes in which we will continue on the reforms. Similar is the question of IBC. We can see today what difference it is making because the approach that the IBC takes, Insolvency Bankruptcy Court takes, is not to shut the business. Bankruptcy, yes, is part of the name itself, but it doesn't every time end up treating a company as close to its bankrupt, shut it down, finish, but no, the approach IBC takes is to have some kind of a resolution where all right, people who have really exploited the, uh, the, the company in question don't come back through back door, but yet reasonable resolution, better buyer, better management, and therefore keep the institution going, keep the company going, keep the, uh, the company live and kicking rather than shut and cause more distress. So, and in the IBC, one thing which I want to carry forward from Modi 1.0 to Modi 2.0. As soon as this government was formed in 2019, just go back to thinking of what the courts had done with some of the cases which were before them in the name of IBC. When the government realized and because the inputs which were coming from stakeholders was, the IBC is itself probably getting interpreted in such a way that the spirit of the act was being really questioned. We had to quickly and in response to the industry bring in amendment even in the budget session which was the first session after the government was elected to power. And thereby bring in greater clarity that the grey areas were cleared. So that no further such interpretation caused a delay in the process of implementing IBC because the IBC was with a timeline. Company resolutions couldn't wait for decades, we had to get that through in time. So the, the, the point that I'm trying to make in is this road to 5 trillion is not just an abstraction, it's not just this is how we want India to be, but in every micro level too, we are coming in response to the stakeholders. We are trying to give facilitation so that courts and the resolution don't suffer. And if there are interested genuine buyers, we should facilitate so that the company gets back to being on its toes. So if I were to sort of very quickly uh, bring before you the kind of cleansing which has happened, the kind of addressing genuinely the issue of black money. There can be 10, 10, 15, 20 criticism of, oh, what did demonetization do? Matter of fact, there could not have been a greater measure to suck that money out of the system, which was lying dormant. I am giving you a very uh, light-hearted and a not so germane to the conversation example. Any bank, any central bank, when it looks at a currency note, has a circulation of the lifespan of that note, this many times it would probably come into circulation, this many rounds of circulation over, the currency's own life, meaning the worth of the paper, the, you know, the, the texture of the currency note, all of them given, you return the currency to the bank saying this can't anymore be exchanged, it's dead for a currency paper. So you, you know the cycle. And there was absolutely clear indication that the higher denomination notes did not have that lifespan. They had longer and longer lifespans. Meaning they were not coming into circulation, they were elsewhere lying very safely kept in the wraps of good silk laden cloth that they didn't lose their lifespan and it had to be sucked out. Otherwise, the number, the percentage of currency such notes which were being apparently used for transactions reached the level of 
and many of which never got many of such transactions never got into any system whatsoever and in your gdp calculation if you're looking at the value created in this country circulation of money the transactions they were not even adequately representative because so many things were being transacted in hard currency so it was important to make sure that the economy gets to being in some system you go through the bank or you go through the system of making your bills and therefore the transactions could be evaluated otherwise you're evaluating a minuscule of the economy the rest of it was all generously lubricated by such currency you had to do something of that kind each one of us of course can have a view on couldn't it have been done this way that way but it did, it did happen for, with a clear intention of pulling that money out which was otherwise not getting into the system and making sure that becomes the point from where the value of <coughs> registering your transactions or getting it through some kind of process really could happen get that money into the banks explain that it is genuine money tax paid money you have no issue get that money into the banks does not mean that everything which came was fair money clear money tax paid money so it it had to happen so if i said gst was something which we could do the attempt to get the unaccounted money was one of the measures and a collateral and i'm sure this word today will be quoted if i said this it was a collateral benefit but never mind you may want to use it that way or whatever the digitization of indian economy and the rapidity with which people have accepted digital payments <coughs> india has today become a leader in this and there are today wherever the prime minister is having a bilateral meeting with any of the country there are countries which ask you and i don't want to for a minute neither me nor the audience i would think will do any condescending thought on oh it could be you know small economies no major economies have also mentioned to the prime minister that we like to learn from your digitization experience upi united Pay payment interface that we have unified payment interface that we have is become a brand for india people are wondering how we achieved it days of paying cash is over checks are becoming outdated cards plastic are not really the in thing anymore qr codes probably are happening and today the payment portal running people are also looking at beyond qr code you could transact through your phone and finish there is nothing more that you had to do in hard paper hard currency hard plastic cards the rapidity with which fintech companies are coming up with solutions and india is one of the pioneers in this itself has changed the face of indian economy and people are looking at that as a product and a brand of india itself these are i would think major changes as much as industry and i can see quite a few captains of indians in uh, indian industry here industry themselves are going through a clear churn a churn where no longer is it thought about in the old fashioned way you're looking at your business formula itself a davos like meeting could talk about industrial revolution 4.0 but what exactly is that we are aren't we all of us beneficiaries of 4.0 already in some way isn't technology coming in that kind of a big way in many of our industry i'm sure sri parmudur can give us enough examples to say where robotics is coming in where big data is coming in our aadhar has led to so many other different things which are all looking at different ways of doing and running your business so it is not just one or the other but there are major changes major churning major reset of industry which is happening and government is actively engaged in this process your 5 trillion dollar is not going to be with old india it is also going to be because of a rapid change into new india 
and the new India is largely benefiting, benefiting from different levels of technology. And the absorption of technology, for which the government is really facilitating rapidly, is one of the ways in which you are speedily moving towards your destination. It couldn't have been otherwise, especially given the global situation today. If Indian, industry, if Indian GDP, for instance, has more than 50%, in fact, touching 60, 61% contribution of the service sector, Indian service sector, we may like to believe and we will add and we certainly recognize the wide basket that we are talking about when we are talking about service sector. It could be software, it could be hardware. I'd like to add on our traditional things like tourism, culture, wellness, your medical tourism, all this also to it. And our doctors and our nurses and our engineers, the STEM contribution through technology and so on. But what really contributed to the changes are mastery over technology. Some, uh, some of course, uh, cynicists in India would say, oh, you're nowhere near China, all right? You're not hardware. You don't have chip fabrication. They could be all that. And I agree. Nowhere near, probably nowhere near China. But the entire software revolution, which contributes therefore 60% of our GDP, is largely thanks to the private sector and probably some facilitation from the government. Wouldn't we agree on that? And if that's the way India has grown, purely because of its entrepreneurial skills. That's the route we also think will speed up this, this pathway to the, this, this travel to the destination of 5 trillion. And to that, we need to do everything that it takes to facilitate. And that is why when I look at India, the way in which we've been talking about Modi's India about the three sutra that I said, the Nama sutras or the mantras. In Hindi they say sutra, but in mantra, the above, prabhav, and dabhav. That's clearly what governs the government's decision when we say reduce the equity of government to 51% or where possible to further. It's because we should make sure that these are enterprises which are going to run fairly efficiently and be a lean and mean machine. A very critical decision, you uh, may not link it directly to the economy, is also to bring the CDS, the Chief of Defense Staff. The jointness which is required in the defense, <coughs> and uh, as all of you all know, defense is one of the big bit budget items for Indian budget making. Optimal utilization of resources in the defense where a certain kind of a platform or a vector that they buy is possible to be used tri service navy procures its own army procures its own air force procures its own and we all would want to say no no it is important they should be empowered but is there a way in which we could think in joint uh, in in the line of jointness which is something which has been discussed post cargill that's been affected and that certainly will have a contribution towards moving towards a 5 trillion because not that we are going to save money out of it but that will now make us understand that it's possible to produce things in India or even to supply to defense the very idea of the corridor in a very industrially conscious Tamil Nadu in an industrial belt that could all, uh, is already probably producing a lot of components, many of the parts which are going into some of the most sophisticated defense equipments. So that is the kind of India which can today produce many components for equipments which are getting produced by the original equipment manufacturers who are somewhere else. Why is it that they wouldn't want to come and manufacture here? If we have the skills, we have the land, we have the uh, manpower who can do it. And we have the market too. And from here, export is not difficult. We are a rules-based economy. It's a predictable rules-based economy. We are not so opaque as China, let us say. 
So it's possible and therefore that trajectory itself was laid with all this in mind by the Prime Minister. And in the same fashion as I was talking about the IBC is also the approach with which we are looking at companies law. My first attempt and also an earnest attempt which continues till today is to decriminalize everything to do with the company's law or related laws. That very point about which Prime Minister keeps talking and yesterday I was very impressed. Again, uh, Nani Palkiwala Memorial Lecture in Mumbai where the Tata groups <coughs> head Chandrasekhar has spoken that government should trust people, government should trust its own citizens and exactly and that is why when we looked at companies law the number of sections which relate to something or the other leading to criminal approach and therefore penalties or even jail terms. I have gone through this now with a tooth comb. Decriminalizing companies law, ensuring that no other act of the government whether it is IT, whether it is your uh, PMLA, we are making sure that that aspect will be addressed. We do not want a law which is going to treat every business house with suspicion. That is not the intent of this government at all. So that is one of the major things which I would like to do towards honestly making this path to the 5 trillion dollar a lot more easier, a lot more matter of trust between the government and the businesses and therefore this energy also which is gone now guided by the above prabhav and the above rule some of the companies which have been listed to be privatized and for one or the other reason has not been really gaining traction whether it's Air India whether it's the other companies which have been listed the cabinet committee on economic affairs had cleared a list of companies saying go ahead privatizing. No, it didn't move at all and they had their own reasons not to say nobody worked. Every time it moved forward two steps, now we are making sure that these are cabinet decisions which shall be honored and honored in the least possible time. Again, the interest that we took to make sure that they become scaled up, they become nimble banking institutions with so much to have to perform in financial inclusion, in making sure that every citizen of India is able to access a bank and access from where he is rather than search for six kilometers away from where he lives. We have professionalized the banks. We have given tenure security where they should be. And we had made sure that they would pick, pick people, domain experts from outside and they shall not constantly only be getting promoted. Therefore, performance linked pay aspects have also been brought in. So the public sector banks themselves are going through a lot of churn, not just the merger, but the cultural change we want them to have so that it becomes a lot more sensitive towards expanding their business and not presume, all right, the government gives us equity every year, we can, no, it shall be definitely viewed from the point of view of uh, performance. And all this at a time when I am being told repeatedly that no, there is a sense of fear. There is a sense of fear that people are not able to take decisions, so it is a different kind of uh, you know uncertainty. You may infuse capital into the banks, but it is not going any further because people are very scared of taking decisions, what if the three C's follow them afterwards? The CAG, the CIC and the CVC, CBI and the CVC. The Prime Minister himself has been talking and interacting with all of them saying absolute genuine commercial decisions are never going to be questioned. But yet, we can't be sitting and saying, oh my God, if I move an inch forward, it can upset a whole lot of officers and therefore I wouldn't even take action against where there is clear evidence of wrongdoing. 
In fact, from my side, I made my effort very clear. I got the bank chiefs. I had the CBI director. I had two joint directors sitting. I said, please feel free, question them. But it was very clear that in system, in place in the system, no case of the bank could be so motive taken by the CBI. The banks have an internal committee, post which we have appointed a CVC committee also, outside of it. But the bank's internal committees are absolutely competent enough to look at which case is suspect and which not which can be addressed purely by a departmental action and which probably cannot. And it is only such cases which are then sent to the RBI being the regulator. Now post the RBI, the bank and the RBI together think, no, this has to be given off to the CBI, therefore it goes to the CBI. So the banks themselves have enough competency to decide who or which case should go to the CBI. And then post sending to the CBI to say, oh my God, I'm scared of CBI. Something doesn't add up there. So we made it possible for the bank to interact with the CBI, not just once in my presence, but post my meeting in my presence with them. We've had the CBI go to every region and talk to the bank officials to say what they can do, to say what they should do, and to say what is possible to be done within their realm. Just to assure people, saying, no, I mean, where is this fear coming from? I'm not saying you shouldn't have fear. But is the fear based on what is the reality? So we've enabled that kind of a discussion. And just to place things in a certain perspective, so if this is the route in which cases come to the CBI, from among those cases, that which has some element of money, siphoning of money, an uncounted money, slush money, only those from the CBI go to the enforcement directorate. Just as the ED cannot go to the CBI, Suomoto takeaway cases, which they want to handle, the CBI cannot go to the banks to take away cases which they want to handle, but banks are not giving. No, this process doesn't work this route. It works the other route. The banks decide to give it to CBI. CBI then decides to give it to the ED, and it is only through that the processes start operating. And today, before you, I would want to just say, when I met up with the banks, I clearly gave them two requests. I said, please go back. In each zone, make sure you have a general manager level committee appointed, which will look at all the past cases which are waiting without a conclusion. You've not handled them to CBI. You've not taken any action on them. You're sitting over them saying, what should I do with them? And this is not for one year, two years, three years. They themselves said it is, oh, it's been there for a long time. So I've asked the banks to please go back. Review all the cases which are lying at your desks. That which you can sort out within your own organization, sort it out. And that which you think you cannot, send it to the CVC committee that we've now appointed beyond the banks. But give me a report. Tell me what you could do with it. Are you going to continue sitting with them? Or is there a resolution possible? So that's one of the things which we've told the banks. So that they can at least pay based on some policy, clear up. Like the way we came up for the GST. Pre-GST cases had a formula, a tick box based formula. You thought yourself belonging to a particular box. The solution was there before you. you. Do this, your case gets over. You don't even need to go and debate or argue or negotiate with anybody. Nearly 95% of all the cases in GST, pre-GST days cases, are closed.
about 30, 35,000 crores. I'm not giving you an exact amount. I may not be able to give it at this stage, but around that kind of a figure has been settled. The, the total value of the cases as pending, when it was pending, was over 2 lakh crores. The dispute. And of course, there is another 5% which are big ticket cases, which are still not into the scheme. The scheme's time is over. So that has to be fought in the courts. But at least, and I assume small, medium industries which were in disputes, have all sorted the mess out. We are taking this approach of, you know, settle it, don't linger, don't fester with the problem. Facilitation. Sarkar ki prabhav. I'd like to do that for income tax. I'd like to do that, if possible, for anything else concerning the ministry because we want to start life afresh. And that life afresh is technology driven. No person to person interface. No giving a piece of paper and saying, you, you've got to pay this up. It shall come through technology. It shall carry a document identification number. And if it doesn't carry a document identification number, I, I openly have told this to many industry groups, you treat this paper as non-est. It shall legally be unsustainable, trusting people. And post that, if there is a question being asked, you would, in using the digital media, answer. You will not go meet anybody. You don't need to sit before anybody and say, look, I'm honest, I'm sincere. No, you just reply. That's the story, end of the story. But if post the reply, the department still wants to deal with this, there shall be some officer that time, again, digitally, uh, through some random process, some officer somewhere would be asked to deal with this case. It could be as far as Gohati, an officer position there to deal with the case in Chennai. And it can be done through their correspondence rather than one to one. So total faceless system of dealing with taxpayers with <coughs> due dignity and honor being kept intact, trusting people again. So that is something which I want to underline saying this is the kind of approach with which this government wants to deal with the uh, taxpayers. There is a brief mention about relationship with the RBI. I'm sitting with an audience who are talking about Nani Palkiwala Memorial. I'm also one of those who was very influenced from my school and college days by the lectures, the budget. If Government of India budget was one thing, Nani Palkiwala budget was the other. And all of us have learned from that kind of a budget speeches. The reason why, you know, in a way brought in Palkiwala and also about the importance of such lectures and the importance of budget making and so on is also to underline the centrality of institutions and their role. The relationship with the RBI. And for whatever reason, there was this whole Criticism, oh my God, Modi government doesn't respect institutions. Look at the way he's dealing with RBI. I would want to ask the same question today. What is the relationship of the government with RBI now? Do we have a picture? Do we have anything to worry about? Do we have anything to criticize? I'll be glad to hear. And is it with uh, just one uh, incident? The entire last one year, and particularly at critical times, the respect, mutual respect, the Reserve Bank to India government and government of India to the Reserve Bank is there for everyone to see. I'll just touch upon two other things because I know you planned some uh, question-answer session which I'll be glad to participate. Again, using the principle of above, prabhav and dabhav, the government is not running away from its role as social welfare champions. Whether it's the farmers, whether it's the health care of citizens, particularly the poor and those who are otherwise marginalized, there is not a bigger scheme than the Ayushman Bharat anywhere in the world. 
giving coverage to this many number of families and the amount is not just a paltry amount, it's 5 lakhs per year. And therefore that now is also seen in the last uh, July budget, an expansion. We are present in that. Farmers and farmer welfare, I don't need to elaborate on each one of the points on which the government has been concerned. And in today's language, everyone would say, all right, after post-July uh, budget, you've probably come out every Friday and given some announcement. You, you addressed only the supply side. You really have not bothered about the consumption. The demand side remains lukewarm and therefore nothing is moving. No. In the announcement that we made, and specifically coming out with a set of projects, we have proven, and we shall continue in that path, of spending on infrastructure. 100 lakh crores in the next five years, and not just hazy amount. The list of the pipeline projects for this, both center, state, and private partnership, in which the government shall actively play a role to ensure that the infrastructure spending is focused and goes through an expected set of projects. And infrastructure not just for road, road, roads, but also infrastructure for agriculture, infrastructure related to food processing, infra infrastructure for energy, are very well thought out so that one money goes to the hands of the people who need it, asset is created in that route, and because of the asset creation, the country benefits both in the medium and short term and further in the long term. We made it a point to come up with this announcement. Uh, although I was laying a self-imposed condition saying, sorry, I shall not speak till about the budget because 30 days at least should be the as sacred days when I don't really indulge in talking about the economy. 31st December, I ensured that it would be announced. And beyond that, no announcements have been made. But that announcement was critical because that's a promise kept. In July budget we announced, we came up with specific action points for it. Specific action points for also supporting the NBFCs because they are the last mile connectivity to the that consumer who would want financial assistance. The partial guarantee which the government has given for pooling assets is essentially towards making sure that NBFCs survive, they get the liquidity that they want, and with that they are able to further give credit to those in the rural areas, so that consumption increases, the demand side is addressed. And the DBT to the farmers, Prime Minister had to announce again, he went probably to Tumkuru somewhere in Karnataka and at one go ensured that a large number of farmers were given directly into their accounts, the monies. So without going further, uh, we placed a lot of importance on corporate governance, ensured that the CSR regulations are made more uh, stakeholder friendly. And at a time when political considerations or any other consideration has dominated some states also to rethink on contracts which have been signed. <coughs> Reneging on contracts has a big impact on the country. Whilst you are looking for finances from international funding agencies to make sure some big ticket projects are going on, reneging contracts or even placing a question mark on them affects the country's image and also affects the prospect of future investments. We are engaging with states to make sure that they become a part of this Team India which can lead towards building this 5 trillion. It's not as if we are sitting in Delhi and saying we'll build 5 trillion. It has to happen through the states. We are engaging with the states to make sure that they participate in this whole exercise. Because it's for all of us rather than just a wish list of Delhi. A lot of steps have also been taken on energy security, alternative energies, not just uh, renewable, but also looking at uh, any other way of uh, getting public transport also to be you know, influenced by the energy policy of the government. 
the solar alliance is getting widened. So at this stage, I think with these uh, broad indicators to how we are planning to take the country towards a $5 trillion economy, I seek all your support. I had a thought uh, also to probably speak on Article 370 because that is also part of a larger consideration towards uh, $5 trillion. Article 35A, again that which denied the economic development of JNK, but I'm sure I'll be able to bring this, those when probably there are some questions, but I'm very grateful that this opportunity was given to me and I hope I've broadly put a picture before you addressing the topic which has been given to me. Thank you very much.